glad you're here. If you visit with us, and uh, I didn't call your name. It's not because I, I'm not glad you're here. I am glad. I just, uh, I didn't get all the names down. So uh, thank you for coming, and thank you for worshiping with us here uh, at Evers Chapel. It's a beautiful day outside, isn't it? I walked out the front steps, and I thought to myself, man, we ought to be having church out here rather than, rather than having it in, in, inside. And, and who knows, we might do that one Sunday morning. You can't ever tell. Uh, we're not bound up by walls, are we? We can't be, uh, can't be locked in to, to places like this. Uh, uh, as beautiful as it is and as, as wonderful as it is, uh, uh, let's be free this morning. And let's let the Lord have his will and his way. Uh, in this place today, as we talked about in Sunday school, let's give him praise today. And he is worthy of our praise. God is worthy of our praise. We can't imagine. Uh, Lewis had us try to imagine uh, uh, what God is like and what God does, and, and it, it just boggles your mind when you stop and think about it. And, uh, you can't comprehend all that he is and all that he does uh, as he lives among us. Uh, and I'm glad for that. He's not up in heaven. He is there. But he's also right here in this midst this morning, and I praise him for that and praise you for, for being here and recognizing that and, and joining with us as we worship. If you have your Bible this morning, I ask you to take it and turn to a passage of Scripture that uh, all of us know about. We've uh, read about it. We've talked about it. But it's, uh, it's an important passage, and I want us to look at it again this morning. It's, it's a part of the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples. Uh, over in Matthew, over in John's Gospel, I'm sorry, over in John's Gospel in the 13th chapter and the 15th verse, Jesus uh, does something that uh, we ordinarily uh, would not think that Jesus would do. Uh, but Jesus being who he was and, and being true to his character from day unto day uh, was perfectly willing to, to, to take on this task that usually would have been reserved for the lowest servant in the house. Not just for a servant, but for the lowliest servant in the house. And you'll understand what Jesus did as you find that passage in, in John 13, and beginning in verse 2. And as you find it, would you stand to your feet, please, and follow along as I read it, uh, because we know this is the Word of God, and we want to respect it as His Word. We want to treasure it in our heart. We want to rightly divide it this morning so that we be workmen as we go from this place and need not be ashamed as we stand in the marketplace of life. In verse 2 of chapter 13 of John's Gospel, we find these words, And supper being ended, the devil already having put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I do not wash you, Peter, you have no part in me. Simon said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but, but my hands and, and, and my head and everything else about me. I want all of you that I can possibly have. That's what Peter was saying. Jesus said to him, he was bathed, only needs to wash his feet. But he's completely clean, and you're clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed his feet, their feet, he taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. 
If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And then one verse that I want to share with you over in uh, uh, Matthew's Gospel, and then to have Kenneth put it on the, on the uh, uh, screen, but in the 23rd chapter of the book of Matthew, and the, the 11th verse, this is what Jesus says. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let's pray together. Father, as we gather together in your house this morning, we treasure these times, these moments, Lord, that we can spend with you and your word. And Lord, we thank you for the message in your word. Lord, how it teaches us to live our lives from day unto day, Father, in a way that not only pleases you and honors you, but also that blesses others. Because, God, we are to be a blessing to others. We're to go out into this world, and we're to touch lives wherever we find them, Lord, with the good news of the gospel. And, Lord, we're so mindful that we do that in so many, many, many different ways. And we thank you for every single one of those ways. Father, teach us a new way this morning. Help us to, to just reinforce something that we've heard and that we know all of our life. And Lord, most of all, help us to commit to that. Father, that we'll study this morning. And we'll praise you and thank you for all that's accomplished. For we pray this in the sweet name of Jesus, our Lord. And for his sake we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I took a little impromptu poll before church this morning. I talked to the deacons as we met for prayer this morning, and uh, uh, I talked with the choir members as we were getting ready to come out and uh, 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 come into the service. And this is a question I asked them. What do you want to do, or what did you want to do when you were growing up? What about when you were a child? What did you want to do? One of them said, I wanted, to be, I wanted to be a cowboy. I'm not going to tell you that Joe Nem said that, okay? Uh, uh, Y'all can, uh, can adjust to see how well the, uh, they, they turned out, okay? I'm not going to tell you that Wanda said that she was going to to be a teacher. I'm not going to tell you that Danny wanted to be a grease monkey. Can you believe that? Danny a grease monkey? And all kinds of things, and I'm not picking on them. I'm just uh, sharing with you some funny things. You know, all of us, when we were growing up, we had those kind of aspirations, didn't we? Some of us wanted to be firemen. We thought the grandest thing in the world would be to get on the back end of a fire truck and ride down the road and jump out and grab the hose and, and squirt water on a fire. Now, not a lot of us grew up to be firemen. Some of, some of you guys want to be good baseball players. I wanted to be a great baseball player. Obviously, if you've ever seen me play ball, you know that that didn't work. I'm not a, a good baseball player. As a matter of fact, I got a trophy one time in softball, but it came from another team. The team that beat us gave me a trophy. Can you believe that? That tells you what kind of ball player that I am. Uh, uh, little girls, same way. Some of you probably want to be ballerinas. Got any ballerinas in this place? Not going to ask you if you wanted to be, uh, but, but you see, some want to be a great singer. Others want to be a good parent. You know, there are many, many aspirations. And obviously, as we grow, our aspirations change, don't they? Uh, Joe's not a cowboy. He's never rode a... a uh, in the church on his, uh, on his trusty steed. Uh, Danny doesn't have a garage this morning. Uh, others who said that they uh, uh, were, well, they wanted to be. Uh, it didn't turn out like that. They changed. You know, that's true of all of us. A lot of times we come to a place and, uh, uh, where we have to make decisions concerning our life's choices. I always did get amazed when I was at the Baptist Center. And you'd go in uh, uh, one day and you'd say to a person, now, what's your major? And they'd say, well, I want to do early childhood education or I want to do forestry, I want to do mathematics, I want to, I want to do education, whatever. And then you'd go about a year, you'd come back and you'd say, well, 
How's it going? Well, I had to change my major. I decided that that's not what I wanted to do. And still, folks, there are folks that graduate from the University of Georgia who have not one inkling of an idea of what they want to do with their life. And that's, that's kind of sad, isn't it? Because that's a challenge. I know what I'm here to preach about this morning, talk to you about this morning. You know, in, in my survey, and in listening to people, there is one thing that, one occupation, one thing that I've never heard anybody aspire to be. Nobody, and I suppose you could ask a hundred people that question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Nobody would say, I want to be a servant. I want to be a servant. That's my aspiration. That's my highest aspiration life. You know, the inner us, the driving force of us, the natural driving force of us, says that that's not the way to attain greatness. We had a lot rather be a people, and I'm not condemning anybody, but we had a lot rather be a people who will be served rather than be a people who will serve. Now, I want to let you know something this morning. That's not what Jesus teaches. That's not what he teaches. By example, by teaching, he tells us that the way to greatness is through the path of servitude. Can you get the picture of what we read about this morning? Our Lord, about to die on a cross, about to give his life for all mankind, for you and for me and for, for all of those that, that have been born and will be born, gets up, shucks off his robe, wraps a towel around his waist, takes a basin of water, and begins to act out or to, to fulfill the part of the lowliest servant in the house. Not just a servant, but the lowliest servant in the house. The one that was least respected. The one that got all the jobs that nobody else wanted to do. Our Lord was perfectly willing to fulfill that role, to teach us that the pathway to greatness is not having your feet washed, but is washing feet of others. Now we question a lot of times, why is that? Why would Jesus say that the pathway to greatness for a Christian is through servitude. Why in the world do we have to be servants rather than to be kings? Why in the world do we have to take that pathway? Why in the world do we have to decide to do that? Because you know, I learned from the scriptures that servants are not born, they're made. They're not born, they're made. They choose along the way. So my question to you this morning, and here's what I want us to explore for a few minutes. What does it take to make a great servant? Knowing, folks, that none of us are excused from servitude in the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, did not Jesus say that when he comes back and he begins to question people, the questions that he's going to ask is not, were you a great church member? Were you a, a, a faithful tither? But he's going to ask questions like this. He's going to say to those that who come before him, well, you know, one day I was hungry. And I, I, you gave me something to eat. 
One day I was thirsty, and, and you gave me something to eat, or you didn't give me something to eat. One day I was in jail. Can you imagine Jesus saying that? I can't. Because Jesus goes to jail with every person who goes there. One day I was in jail. And you visited me or, or, or you didn't even think about me. While I was there, you didn't even pray for me while I was there. And what he's saying to us is you either have the heart of a servant or you don't have the heart of a servant. Now what does it take to make a good servant, a great servant? Three things that I want us to glean from this passage. Looking at the life of Jesus. The first thing that I want us to glean from it in the making of a great servant is one with an humble heart. The Bible has a lot to say about our hearts. Now when it talks about our heart, it's not really talking about the physical organ that beats inside of our chest. But the Bible is talking about what the Israelites and those who wrote the Bible before they had stethoscopes and MRIs and all the things that would allow them to look into the, the body. The Bible is talking about the center of our life. And to the Israelite, the, the life, life was focused in the heart. The Bible says this, as a man thinks in his heart, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. What Jesus is saying and what the scripture is saying to us is the heart is the driving force of our life. And to be a good servant, we first of all have to have the right kind of heart. Now what kind of heart is that? Several things Jesus teaches me. Number one, he teaches me that it's not a heart that is desirous of glory. Jesus didn't wash those disciples' feet there that night so that they would glorify him. Jesus didn't wash those disciples' feet so they would say, oh my, look at Jesus, let us do this. Jesus washed those feet because he had a heart that God had laid upon him to, to wash that feet. The king of kings, the Lord of lords, the glorious God among us, who according to Romans thought this. He said, it's no loss for me to come down from heaven and to take on a servant, the role of a servant. That's where my heart is, is what Jesus was saying. I've got to fulfill my heart. You know, the Bible also says the Son of Man came not to, to be served, but to serve. You know, as a matter of fact, if you look at the life of Jesus, you're going to learn something. I have. I did this week as I was thinking and preparing this message. I learned that Jesus is most comfortable when he was serving, not when he was preaching, even though he knew the value of preaching. Uh, when he was most comfortable was when he was serving Mankind most often one on one. Because Jesus had a heart that was humble before God. Jesus had a heart. Jesus had a life in which he found it comfortable to serve. I ask you this morning. Now we understand that we don't have a heart problem so much as far as that's concerned. We have a we have a mind problem, don't we? I ask you to examine your life this morning. And you don't have to answer this question. But you think about it and you answer it in your own heart. Does the comfort zone of your life include service to others? Are you happiest when you're serving or when you're being served? Would you rather be served than to serve others from day unto day? I want to tell you something this morning. According to the scripture, according to Jesus' example, you'll never be a good servant until your heart is humbled to service. Until you say, Lord, I'm your servant. 
I'll do what you ask me to do. So first of all, Jesus teaches me that to be a good servant, we have to have an humble heart. There's a second thing that I want you to notice. To be a good servant, Jesus teaches us that we have to have a harnessed spirit. A lot of people today have a spirit problem. I want to tell you a story this morning. A story about when I was growing up. It's called the story of the mule. You know, I learned, and I thought a lot about it a lot of times, you can learn a lot from a mule. You know, you really can. When I was growing up, we lived right next door to my granddaddy and uh, grandmama. My granddaddy, for as long as I could remember, had a mule whose name was Emma. That was her name. When uh, 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 you would uh, call her, you'd just call her the Emma, and she'd come along because she was a, a sweet and a gentle mule. We didn't worry about going in the pasture. We didn't worry about her kicking us. We didn't worry about her biting us. We didn't worry about her doing the things that a lot of times we had heard mules are, are prone to do. She was sweet. She was gentle. She'd let us ride on her when we were little. No problem whatsoever. Just the perfect mule. Well, my granddaddy didn't just have a mule just to have a mule. You see, back then, mules weren't pets. They were the tractors. Of that day. I don't think anybody in our community had a tractor. But several of them had mules. Well, spring would come. And Granddaddy was not a, a big farmer, but he did farm. Uh, we always had a big garden and we always had a, a, a bottom co corn patch. If uh, you grew up in the country, you know what I'm talking about. And I would remember, I remember when the time came. To bust up the garden, that's what they called it. To bust up the garden, Granddaddy would go out to the to the barn, and he'd call Emma. And of course, because she was who she was, she didn't resist. She didn't say, "Well, I'm too busy eating over here. Good grass over here. I'll be there in a little while." She would just come, knowing, I'm sure, as mules, or want to know if they are. What was coming about? And Granddaddy would take the harness. Y'all know what a harness is? He'd harness. And he'd put that harness on Emma. And then he would hook her up to the plow stock. And he'd go about plowing the business, the, the garden. Now, why would he do that? I ask myself. I ask you this morning. Because Emma was a mule. And Emma, though she was sweet, though she was gentle, though she had all kinds of power, she was like most mules. You've heard the old phrase, stubborn as a mule. You've seen that sometimes in, in people. I understand what that means. You see, Emma liked to do what mules like to do. And Emma didn't want sometimes to do what mules don't want to do. And I can just imagine my granddaddy calling to Emma and saying, Emma, come on down and let's, let's get the garden ready. And Emma would just walk in there and start right up and down those rows and they'd be laid off so pretty. No need for a harness. I don't think that's the way that it works. I believe, I know that it's not the way. Out of words. You see, Granddaddy had to put a harness on Emma to control her actions. He had to put that harness on. He didn't do it to kill her spirit. He didn't do it to make her less of a mule. She wasn't any less of a mule than if he had not put that harness on. But that harness was the control of her spirit. By that harness, my granddaddy, sometimes he'd let me, he didn't let me plow a whole lot, but sometimes he would let me, or he would take that plow stock, and he'd say, gee, or ha, and Emma would know exactly what to do. Sometimes he'd pull on the, uh, on the plow line, and 
And, and, and she would turn, she would obey because of that harness. Now, I'm not calling anybody in here a mule this morning. I understand that. But I do recognize that a lot of times we can be like old Emma. We can be like a mule. You see, we want to do what we want to do. Or sometimes we don't want to do what we need to do. We want to do our own thing. And folks, that doesn't work when you're a servant. You see, what the Bible says is the spirit must be harnessed. Now, God is not trying to kill our spirit. God is trying to harness the power that he has put it in us so that it can be re redirected to the right and the maximum potential. Friend, I want to tell you something. Son, I told you you learn a lot from a mule. I learned from old Emma that when I say yes to the influence of God, when I respond to the harness that God has put on me and on my spirit, then can I be the servant that God would have me to be. God's not trying to kill me. God's not trying to, to cheat me. He's not trying to make me something that I'm not. But he's just trying to harness what he put in me and in you a long, long time ago. I pray this morning that we'll understand that we'll never be good servants until we have that harnessed spirit. Until we say yes to God, to his pleading, to his leadership, to his guiding in our life. You see, it takes an humble heart to be a great servant. Jesus had that. It takes a harnessed spirit. Jesus had that. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, who when his father said, I'm going to send you down to earth. I'm going to send you even to a cross to die. And when Jesus said, Lord, I don't want to do that. That's not, that's not what my spirit tells me to do. But Lord, if you're pulling on that rein and you're guiding me that way, then I'm willing to do that because you are the master and I am the servant. What better example do we have than the one who is willing to get up? Take on literally the form of a servant without being prodded. Take up the tools of serv servitude and begin to bow before his disciples and to wash their feet there that night. You see, it takes a harness. Spirit. But it also, and notice this, it takes an honest walk. It takes an honest walk. I want to remind you of something this morning. God is watching your walk. God is watching your walk. He watches every minute of every day. He watches every step that you take. And according to the scripture, the walk that we take is going to weigh heavy as we stand before him on judgment day. Now, I'm not saying we will work our way to heaven. Don't misunderstand me. But I am saying that if we walk the walk of a servant, if we're honest in our effort, we don't just talk the talk of a servant, but we're, we walk the walk of a servant. Then we'll hear those words that every servant, I believe, desires to hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. I had a professor in college, one of the wisest men that I've ever known, learned as much about preaching and teaching from him as I did anybody 
that ever had. His name was Dr. Jim Westbury. He was pastor of Morningside Baptist Church in, in Atlanta for 32 years. Dr. Jim would talk to us, young preacher boys, about what we needed to be doing, how we needed to, to live our life and, and, and do what God would please God. And this was one of the things that I remember what Dr. Jim had to say many times to us. He would say this, Fellas, don't let your walk make you talk a lie. Don't let your walk make you talk a lie. You know, it's easy standing here and talk about servitude. And all of us would say, I know what you're talking about, preacher. I know you need a humble heart to be a good servant. I know you need a harness spirit to be a good servant. I know you need an honest walk to be a good servant. But in here, folks, is not what matters. Because out those doors is a world in which Jesus calls us to be good servants. Every day, we have an opportunity to serve. And if we're going to become anything in the kingdom of God, it won't be that one who says, well, Lord, I, I did great, great things. It'll be one who call, comes at the feet and falls at the feet of Jesus and said, Lord, my highest aspiration in life was to serve you and to serve others. Lord, I didn't mind doing whatever needed to be done. I didn't mind washing people's feet. I didn't mind putting an arm around them when they were sick and suffering. I didn't mind those things that most of the world looked on with disdain and disgust in their lives. I want to just ask you a question this morning in closing. What is it that you need to do to become a great servant? I know if we could see all the service that goes on in this room, we'd be amazed. We'd be amazed. But is there anything, anything in your life this morning that keeps you from being the servant that God would have you to be? Is it a lack of humbleness in your heart? A heart that says, rather, Lord, I, I want to be served rather than I want to serve. Is it an unharnessed spirit? Maybe you've said, well, Lord, I'll give you Sunday morning. I'll give you Sunday night. I'll give you an offering plate. When Jesus says, the thing I need is the control of your spirit? Is it an unhonest or a dishonest walk this morning? Letting you talk make your life out to be a lie before men and before God. I want to remind you that this altar is open. I want to encourage you if there are things in your life that you know need to be dealt with between you and God to come to this altar this morning. I want to invite you to just fall on your face. And the first thing you'll have to do is what I had to do when I was preparing this message. I had to bow before God and just say, Lord, forgive me of, of failing to do those. Or forgive me of having or not having a, a, an humble heart. Forgive me of not having a Harness spirit. Forgive me of, of a dishonest walk, Lord. And God will forgive. I know that because he's forgiven me. And then I had to ask him also, Lord, take me right where I am. Take me right where I am. And help me to become the great servant that you would have me to be in the days that are ahead. Help me to be that servant that will bless others, and will draw others into the kingdom of God in this place.
as God moves in your heart. Maybe you need to put your faith in him this morning. You say, I'm not even a servant of, of God because I'm not a child of God. Would you come this morning? And just say today, I want to put my faith in Christ. I want to be that servant. I want to be that one. I want to be the one who is great. Not so I can laud over it, but so I can serve others. Maybe you need to come this morning and just say, Lord, I want to rededicate my life. I failed in so many ways. And Lord, I just want to rededicate my life to you. And I want to ask you, church, to pray for me and to walk with me, to help me to be the servant that God wants me to be. None of us were born wanting to be servants. But my friend, when we were born into the kingdom of God, God put in our life that desire. God put in our life that direction. And it's inescapable in any Christian's life. The most blessed work that we will do is when we're serving others. Would you pray with me? Father, Lord, I know this morning that it's really hard. Lord, because of our life, because of who we are, because of what we're made out of, it's hard to yield ourselves.